Good morning, everybody. My name is Tiffany Chen from the Newton Needham Regional Chamber. Thank you all so much for joining us this morning. Our topic today is on closing generational gaps in the workplace, presented by a team from InSource Services. And before I introduce you all to our speakers today, um, just a couple housekeeping items. Um, this, media, this webinar is being recorded, so for any of those who registered and could not attend, we will be sending it out to everybody. And for those who are here, you can reference this video at a later time as well, along with the presentation slides. Uh, we also want to thank all of our diversity, equity, inclusion sponsors of these series. Um, and as part of the series, we are dedicated to offering a program on DEI once a month or at least once a month. So with that, definitely stay on our list and we hope you'll join us for our future programs as well. Um, and one last thing, um, if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the Q&A and we'll do our best uh, to adjust them as they come in and we'll try to leave time at the end um, for Q&A, but um, depending on how time goes, um, we'll see if we'll be able to have that time. But again, feel free to drop them in the chat or the Q&A and we'll address them as the best we can. Uh, with that, I would like to introduce you all to Salaha Walsh of InSource Services. Thank you all so much. Oh, Salaha, you're on mute. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, thanks, Tiffany. And we're happy to be here today. And are, we're glad to have a big crowd. And we're excited for this presentation, which we hope will be interactive, fun, and informative. So I'm joined here today with my colleagues, Rachel Niederhoff, who is the HR Generalist at InSource, and Dequal Graham, who is our Chief People Officer. And so to this presentation, we'll each bring our experience in HR at InSource and also with our clients. And I'll tell you a little bit more about who we are and what we do in a minute. But also we're really excited because we represent three of the generations we're gonna talk about. So we think that might add a little richness to our discussion and uh, maybe a few debates here and there. Um, so as Tiffany said, we're trying to focus on an issue related to diversity each month at the Chamber. And this month, we're looking at diversity and inclusion with a generational lens. So an hour is a very ambitious time frame to talk about the generations in the workforce. But what we're hoping to do is to, to build you know, some general awareness about what the generations, uh, you know, some of the experiences that shape the generations and how we can all work together to open up conversation and create more inclusive workforces that benefit from the richness of the generations and um, strategize about how to manage through some of the conflicts that arise between working with multiple generations in the workforce. Uh, before we get started, I'll just tell you a little bit about InSource. We're based in Wellesley. And we provide finance, HR, and IT services to small to mid-sized companies. So uh, generally, we're working with companies who need those areas of service, but not necessarily at a full time, uh, full on a full-time basis at all levels. So we offer a multi-level team, and often we're working with clients on a long-term basis in any or of, of those areas, or sometimes in multiple of those areas. So whether they're part-time finance, HR, and/or IT department. We also do projects and assessments. A lot of people ask us to come in, take a look at what they're doing and identify opportunities for um, improvement, um, tell them what they're doing well, what they could improve on. We do training like we're doing today. Uh, we do recruiting and we have about 110 employees, which I had to check with Rachel because it seems to change by the day, <laughs> but we're about at 110 now. So we'll bring our experience at InSource here today and also our broader experiences and our lived experiences and, and encourage you to be active in the chat. At the end of our presentation, we're gonna offer some strategies um, about working with the different generations. And at that point, it would be great if you all have ideas to put them in the chat. Um, so let's get going. If you printed out directions to get here today, you're in the right place. My seminars are a great tool to help young homeowners who are turning into their parents. Now remember, they're not programs, they're TV shows. You woke up early, 
No one cares. Yes. So I was using something called Home Quote Explorer from Progressive to easily compare home insurance rates. Was I hashtagging? Progressive can't help you from becoming your parents, but we can help you compare rates on home insurance with Home Quote Explorer. Guess what? The waiter doesn't need to know your name. Do you know? You're muted, Dequel. So as you see, uh, even Progressive is in on this generational fund. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about what we'll do today in terms of our objectives, but uh, unparenting ourselves will not be one of those objectives as Dr. Rick just illustrated for us. What we do hope to do today is to examine some of the general characteristics of the five generations, whether they be in our workplaces or not, there still exist, at least um, generally speaking, five generations. And then we'll look at how they impact um, in the workplace relative to communication style as well as prioritization. And then the value that they add in the workplace and should there be any gaps exploring some strategies to, I don't wanna necessarily say close the gap because the gap can be a reality that can work for us, but to bridge the gap so that there is um, two-way communication and two-way traversing over the bridge. And so what is a generation? We recognize that there, there, there will be some generalization with these points here and perhaps for some, some over generalization, no pun intended, but at a fundamental baseline, we always like to establish what the definition is of what we're talking about. And so for purposes of this discussion today, a generation represents a group of individuals who were born around the same time and they have had some of the same or similar historical events because of that time they've lived through those which of course helps to create some beliefs some attitudes some values some perspectives some characteristics generally uh, there is some disagreement with various social scientists and psychologists but we'll say that a generation is approximately, you know, 20 year span of what we're talking about today. And something that's fundamental, we're all in a specific generation. Some may be on the edge of one or the other, but typically wherever one identifies, that generation is the standard or baseline of comparison. That's a nice way of saying your generation is right and everyone else's is wrong. And so that generation typically looks at others uh, somewhat with a degree of skepticism. Now it's very important because I'm not going to tell you who, but these two people that are presenting with me, you know, they, they were born in a certain generation, but they try to identify with a, another generation. So that is realistic that one may be born in a certain time period, but because of some of those historical significances, because of who you, know, you may have been raised with, you may identify more with a, another generation that is outside of your chronological age zone. Okay, so these are the um, years associated with the different generations. Um, this is the slide where I could have been in two generations, but uh, traditionalists, and so you can see the ages there. Then there's baby boomers, which is I think is the, the largest, uh, well, not anymore, but used to be the largest before millennials took over. Generation X, millennials, and then Generation Z, which often gets sort of combined into millennials because some of the people in Generation Z aren't actually in the workforce yet. And as you see at the bottom, you know, depending upon what you Google and which person or expert you listen to, these years can, can vary um, for various reasons. But for today, this is the, the age range that we'll be focusing on. Take a look at this. Here's, here's a crude way of identifying your generation. And I'm glad that I have Salaha, the HR guru on here. So I'm not gonna say anything to get myself in trouble. And we have Rachel, the HR journalist. I'm definitely not gonna say anything to get in trouble. But think about this for just uh, a, a second. Which end would you prefer? Because whatever, what, what, whatever end you prefer, there may be someone in a, a different generation that doesn't prefer that end. And some people would say in a particular generation, I would never wear something like that. But 
it's a comical way of saying that someone else in another generation may be saying the same thing about what you're wearing and your choice. And so the goal of this is to have some fun, to not create more of a divide, but to, 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 to look at what unites us as opposed to what the world often looks at today as what divides us, because we have more in common than we have not in common. Well, I do have to say, Dequal, if you go back to that slide, well, I've been in HR for a long time. And if we're on the left side of that, I would have, it's interesting that through the years, in terms of different issues that came come up, I would say one of the I, I get often get tough HR jobs. And one of them is to talk to a lot of people that were on the far right of that that have visible underwear as the category of the issue that I've had to have a lot of uncomfortable conversations about. Or at the other end, I might not have had to have as many. So, 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 all right. So I don't want anyone on that side to get offended. What she's saying is no matter what kind of underwear you're wearing, don't let it be visible in the workplace. Right. You move on. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. So, um, you know, as we said, these are more reference points. So these, you know, these are just quick snippets about what are typically uh, traits associated with the different generations. So the, again, they're reference points and they're influenced by the historical events of that period of time. And um, parenting, again, influenced by um, the historical events and the, the time and place. And they inform how people in the different generations communicate, what their priorities are, um, how they approach work, how they approach family. So Dequal and Rachel, feel free to jump in with any historical points. I'm just gonna give a couple of high points just for, in the interest of time. But for example, traditionalists lived through wars, uh, rebuilding from wars, the Great Depression, um, the nuclear families, they sort of, you know, it was a work hard generation. So they, they tend, and again, these are very broad strokes and obviously individual style and experiences influence them. They value authority, they respect top-down management, they work hard, their, atti their attitude can be make do or do without. Um, baby boomers, you know, had a lot of hopeful things happening in their generation. Um, uh, Woodstock, moon landings. Um, uh, there's some research that says because their parents that were traditionalists work so hard to give them what they had, they really want to succeed. They're very driven by work. So, um, and again, just, these are just highlights. So they work hard and um, some believe, expect some degree of deference for their opinions, their hard work. They tend to, I guess, be workaholics, they work hard. Uh, the next generation X, um, at some of these broad categories of historical events uh, seem very stereotypical, but apparently there was much more uh, openness about divorce. There were more people going into the workforce, a lot of latch key children who were, you know, expected to independently manage much more. And, um, you know, a lot of, and again, now we're hitting, getting closer to Dequal and Rachel's generation. So if you think I'm missing any historical events. Um, so that tended to create a generation that is um, comfortable with authority. They'll work as hard as is needed, but you know, this in the research, it's sort of like they, they work to live versus live to work, which can be different in different generations. And work-life balance is, is important to this generation. Generation Y, um, this is, uh, you know, again, I, I, I tended to be interested by the kind of parenting dynamics in some of these generations as a parent, um, but uh, parents are much more sort of focused on more people are, are um, trying to, to um, get their children involved, give them every opportunity. There's a lot, technology is emerging. Um, it, it was emerging in Generation X, I remember, I have to say, as a baby boomer, I was starting to my career in the late 80s. I remember asking somebody, do I have to keep my computer on? If I shut my computer off, will I lose my email? Just to give you some context. So in Generation X and Y, technology uh, comes into play much more heavily. Uh, generation Y is technology savvy, very goal oriented, um, very um, have been given a lot of opportunities a big focus on fostering self-esteem from a parenting perspective. Um, 
and Generation Y again, largely still developing, but you know, all Generation Y and Z, you know, grew up with cell phones. Uh, they communicate in a different way. Um, uh, there is a, a little bit of a lack of formality and in, in some part driven by the medium by which they tended to communicate growing up, texting, et cetera. Um, whereas I think in some of the earlier generations that tend to be more traditional in terms of how you communicate in writing, uh, there, it, there's some more formality. So uh, one more example, uh, yesterday a client reached out to us and asked for help on something. So the, an IT manager introduced the person to me by email and said, hey, Joe, or whatever his name is, this is Salaha, she might be able to help you with your issue. But she didn't sit, like I read it, I'm like, Joe doesn't know who I am. There's no context. Like you didn't say she knows about this topic. So it, it's very interesting. So I had to stop and not point that out. Um, so different kinds of communication, different ways of interacting and different priorities in terms of where they fall in their career and in their generational um, anchoring. Just to jump in there too, Sal, I think it's really interesting to see with Gen Y and Gen Z how technology is integrated into everything. You'll notice when new people start, they add you on LinkedIn like that same day or when you're um, telling them different things about the company or um, you know, when I'm explaining benefits, they say, oh, is there an app for that? So it's, it's not, they don't want the new hire packet. They want the app. They want to connect on social media. Um, so I think it's really important to note that in the workplace. And that's a great point because we, we have seen in our recruiting area and consulting that there are some people that actually will forego filling out a job application if they have to do it manually, if, if it can't be automated in some way. And we often find that um, that can be Generation Y and some Generation X. I want to make a note that when you see Gen Y here, that is synonymous with millennial. So it, it's an interchangeable uh, title. We hear millennial sometimes more, but it is one and the same. And I just wanna point out the inherent conflict in some of the generational values that we see on the screen. So if you look at traditionalists, for example, they value uh, authority, top-down management, hardworking. Well, look at how that can create a natural conflict with generation X is because the comfortability with authority may create a degree of laissez-faire. And then if one is only working as needed, it can be interpreted by preceding generations as lazy. So uh, that's just something else to see. You look at baby boomers where it says workaholics versus generation X, um, importance of work-life balance. So is the perception that if one wants to take their earned vacation and don't work on vacation, are they now not to the standard of the expectation of the company because characteristic of one generation is workaholic versus characteristic of another generation is work-life balance. So these are some questions to ask and just to think about, you know, as we do our daily work. Notice generation Y, it says respect or millennials must be earned. Well, if I'm in the traditionalist and respect is automatically given, then, and that is my expectation, then that again can create some degree of inherent conflict, not because one is more important or more disrespectful, but because of the environment and the, 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 the aspects of the culture that have shaped a particular generation. So this slide just shows what the um, breakdown is of the current workforce. So you can see that currently the baby boomers and millennials are making up the biggest group um, for their generations and the silent traditionalists are sort of phasing out. Um, and then we'll see how Gen Z um, comes in in years to come. This is just something that's taken for, for your benefit if, if you you know if it if it's beneficial for you, uh, the projected labor force by year 2023, um, as you see here, the source cited below, um, we, we see that the millennials, as Rachel just said, will probably occupy the majority of the labor force uh, with Gen Z coming behind and Gen X phasing out, which is normal and natural as we all age, but it's just interesting to put the age range demarcation on it. So from a, a secession planning, if there's any people here that are planning 
you know, secession plans or if there are people that are planning, you know, retirement, if there are people that are planning, you know, what they're forecasting for recruiting and hiring may be, this can be a useful tool um, for you. So now we're going to jump into some strategies, specific things that we hope will, will help um, highlight, you know, ways we can all work together, not saying that one generation is better than the other and one generation has to cater to the other, but some things that all generations can think about when working with a different generation. So these are, we're going to touch on upon some highlights, um, but in doing some background research for this presentation, we came across a resource that is also helpful. I mean, obviously in an hour, we can't give as much specificity as we would like, but Tiffany's gonna share in the chat a resource that actually provides a grid about different kinds of interactions in the workplace and good strategies that you might wanna consider for different generations around, around some of those. So here, we're just kind of touching highlights and we're, as you can tell, trying to go through the slides at a pretty rapid pace because there, this is a good topic for discussion and interaction. So we're hoping that we're gonna have some time for that at the end. Okay, bridging the gap, strategies for communicating with the traditional. So um, again, these are people who have worked hard and um, have really um, overcome, particularly in the early part of the traditional things, uh, traditional phase a lot of obstacles. So, sh you know, show respect for their experience and length of service, um, balance face-to-face -face interactions with offline solution options. So for example, using mul multiple mediums. So Rachel mentioned that uh, when we hire, a lot of people are asking for uh, online interfaces and so forth. Well, the vast majority of our hires uh, over the last year have probably been under the age of, I don't know, 30. So 32 or something. So, um, but we, you know, you want to make sure to balance the, um, the needs of everybody in the workforce. So for example, when you have uh, processes like open enrollment or rolling out a new uh, program or, um, or platform at your organization, recognize that. So it's very interesting for us because we have three practice areas and we have a very large IT practice area. And so obviously that group is by nature of their profession and probably their generation quite fluent in technology. But there are others, I was going to say of us, who you know, are, are you know, on a learning curve. So to make sure to balance opportunities to have, you know, to, to discuss some of the things, to have online resources for some of the things, to have independent interaction with some of the, the, the things that you're, you're um, trying to introduce into the workforce. Um, be mindful of language informality. I mentioned this example before, uh, but any of you who have college age children, I know that for all my kids' orientations um, at college, they're, you know, they have meetings. And one of the things that they always, always cover, at least in the three I went to, was um, when you write to your professors, don't say like, hey, and what, you know, to use a kind of deference, which is interesting because you would think that they might come somewhere in the middle. But uh, so, you know, just be aware that there's a sensitivity to formality. It doesn't make it right or wrong, but just to have some awareness about that. Again, say please and thank you. Um, don't rush or pressure them. Especially, especially when showing them how to use their new smartphone. Yes, yes, I know. So I'm sure many people have, um, you know, I, I know uh, my kids are always fearful when they're going to see their grandparents because the first thing anyone asks them to do is to do something with their with their cell phone. And so, you know, to understand it's not just that they're not taking the time to learn. This is, it's sort of like a foreign language, right? If you grew up in a country and were immersed in the language, you know it well, you know it fluently. If you're going to visit a country, you might learn, a, you know, a few words to get by. If you're going to visit a lot because you do business in that country, you might, you might um, learn what you need to get by and things that help you for efficiency and so forth. But it's different than being immersed from your birth in that. So, I think that analogy sometimes works um, when you think about it. And it, 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 I use it to try to give my kids more patience when they get those questions. Uh, recognize that each generation has different priorities around benefits. Um, you know, this is a, you could 
debate that probably um, a lot of people value health care benefits, but people in this generation that are thinking about how to transition out are probably concerned about how, uh, you know, their retirement savings will be a priority for them and also increasing um, benefits in health care. Want to highlight, be mindful of language and formality. I remember years ago, years ago, I was with one of my little nephews basically, and we were downtown and we saw Bill Russell and he was walking near the Copley area and we were in our car. I didn't see him. And the young, young fella said, hey, Bill, hey, Bill. And, and Bill Russell's walking down the street. And some of you may remember Tower Records over there on Mass Ave. He's walking down the street, stops. He turns around and it was like, if looks could kill, he did not say hi. And I, I love him, so I'm not, I'm telling you what happened. He did not say hi, he looked at him. He turned back around and kept walking. And I remember popping him in the back of his head, what's wrong with you, that's Mr. Russell. Like, what, you don't refer, I, I know you think you know him, but you don't, that's Mr. Russell. He's not just a basketball player, he's a civil rights activist, he's an icon, you don't do that. But it was hilarious to watch that Mr. Russell that was his knee jerk reaction when no one was around when someone said, hey, Bill, a little kid, he was a kid. Hey, Bill. So that find that as an interesting story of, of, of note. Hey, uh, baby boomers bridging the gap. Um, I think uh, there was there was a lot about working hard and and um, a focus like that. So baby boomers like you to be proactive, offer to partner to get a job done. Don't don't wait for them to ask for help. Um, and uh, I'm sure not many people like this, but don't call them older. Uh, you know, you can use, uh, use more, I guess, respectful um, descriptors, mature, experienced, seasoned, um, honor their experience and ask for advice. I added sincerely on here because nobody wants to be, you know, sort of treated in a condescending way. Don't just do it to get in good with a baby boomer, you know, think about what experience they might have that you could benefit from. And um, just by virtue of having worked longer or seen more kind of seasons of work, if you will. Um, many people in this generation value um, the people side of things. Um, uh, in, in the example of the video, Nicole, well, you knew I was gonna bring this up. Uh, they, one of the examples from the video is the person who asks the waiter their name. Well, in my family, I have that experience every time I go out and it drives me crazy every time. I say, Ron, the waiter doesn't want your name. So I was delighted when I saw that commercial that I was finally validated. So personal style influences. I don't do that and I'm a baby boomer, but in general, making that personal connection and recognizing the people side and the soft side of Interactions, communication is something that this generation tends to value. Um, it's a hardworking generation uh, and, and they like their hard work to be recognized. And, and um, as I said, that this is the generation that grew up with a lot of you know, civil rights movement, Woodstock, a lot of hopeful things. And um, this is interesting. I added this one, optimism doesn't necessarily translate to lack of urgency. So. Um, I was in a meeting with people, I guess, across three generations. There were three of us, and we were tackling some challenging issues. And two of us, a baby boomer, and I think the other one's a traditionalist, basically were like, yeah, it'll, it'll work out. It always does. We, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And the other person who was of a younger generation really wanted a plan. What are we going to do next? Very much more cut and dry, both of which have extreme value. And, and the, the richness of both, both of those perspectives is really helpful. But one, optimism doesn't mean you're out to lunch and a sense of urgency doesn't mean you're focusing on the wrong thing. So to, to be able to really appreciate the value of that. And, and to point out something that, that, that um, I see, you know, working with clients at times, and again, this presentation is, is much larger. We've done this for retreats, four hour sessions, you know, six hour sessions where we break up into groups by generation and have different dialogues, different conversations, solve different issues, work on different strategic plans. It's fascinating to see different pieces of the puzzle come together in a different way. Uh, but look at the first bullet where it says be proactive. 
So think about that in relation to um, Gen X, where the preceding slide talked about Gen X. And again, this is not all Gen Xers, but you know, may, what I think Salah, you said, live, work to live, not live to work. And so see that, it, and so if as a generation X, I don't see what the baby boomer sees and it's perceived as, oh, that person doesn't fit and they're not proactive and they're not a go-getter. Is it that person or is it a characteristic of that generation that can be highlighted for that person to learn to be generation X more proactive? And so something that's fascinating when we say, well, we want people to take the bull by the horn. Well, first of all, they, where's the bull? And point out the horns and show me how to grab it. Do I stand in front of the bull, behind the bull? Teach me a little bit so I know what you're looking at and using your maturity and your experience and your seasoning to make me better. You know, and at the same token, as we see with the, with the next slide, if I can get there, with the next slide is because I have to be as Generation X, I'm putting myself in the category just for purposes of example, I have to be able to, 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 to receive what you're saying with a degree of humility and as we said before, deference. And so when we look at Generation X, some strategies is really listen to what they are saying. Now, one of my wife's favorite actor, this is an ode to her, is Liam Nielsen. She loves all the things that he is in and I love him in Taken. If anyone has ever seen that, listen to me carefully. Um, don't let the generations hijack your business. All right, but we wanna listen carefully. Talking with this particular generation and not at them or not to them. Delegation is absolutely necessary. You know, um, give the boundaries, give the parameters, but let them figure out in some regards the, the, the way they're going to, to build the colors, if you will, around it or within those parameters. Something that's salient is time. You know, many gender X's and some, you know, others value um, time over money. Because remember, there's that balance of, of work life. And so for some, you know, time can be just as important, if not more important than um, money. And this is important to know because some Gen Xs that are in meetings and this research that says some of the small talk before and after meetings actually makes the outcomes and the results of meetings better. Well, Gen Xs sometimes have a problem with small talk because it's like, let's just come in here, do what we have to do and move on because there's other things that I have going on in my life. But there are some areas for growth on either side. And then lastly, you know, providing clear, consistent, fair feedback. Some of us that are parents, we, we may of, of multiple children or even just one, we may have heard the term, that's not fair. That is a characteristic of just generation of looking for areas where there is um, incongruity, incongruences in the area of fairness. Paul, I think we can definitely um, speak to those examples as well when we're working with each other at InSource because when I go to you, I know that you don't want me to waste your time. You want to have an agenda. You want to get to the point. And I think with Salaha, um, a lot of our conversations, I'm asking for her advice while also trying to have a solution. So it's it's interesting to see how all of these different things play out in the workplace amongst each other ourselves. So where to make me feel like where to make it look like I don't have feelings and don't care for you. No, you you have feelings, but but yeah, you you definitely Go say, ahead. all right, what are we meeting about? <laughs> All right. So now we are going to talk. I, I, I'm oh, more like, ahead. what are we meeting about again? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, okay. So here are some strategies for communicating with millennials. So first we have um, to emphasize positives of doing right above negatives of doing wrong. So this just really connects to the millennial sense of finding a deeper purpose for what they're doing on a daily basis. Um, so millennials just want to know that they're making a meaningful contribution to the organization that they're a part of and that they're part of something that's um, going towards the greater good. So we're very um, goal oriented. We want to move up in our organization. Um, you have to remember that millennials in their late 20s and 30s are kind of at the, the stage in their careers where they want to figure out what they're going to be doing for long term. They're kind of in that groove of trying to settle in and move up. 
Um, so emphasizing what your organization is doing positively can make them want to invest in it. Um, and then this also comes with being open to constant critique. So millennials want their ideas to be heard. Um, we've kind of grown up having a seat at the table, um, being able to express ourselves and our opinions. Um, so that can come with critique because a lot of times we're very ingrained in the systems or processes of an organization. And so if we can find a way to streamline that, we will definitely voice that. Um, and so next we have be factual um, and answer the why question. So this also relates back to that idea of having a deeper purpose in the workplace. We don't want our work to be um, repetitive. We want to know that we do have opportunities for upward mobility. Um, we wanna understand what our, our company is doing. So when we ask the why questions, it's really about how did we get to this decision? Um, you know, What is behind the goals of this company and just connecting that to our own own personal um, philosophies. Um, and the Center for Creative Leadership says that one in three millennials are assessing the environment for better options. Um, so that means that millennials come to work and are very willing to be dedicated to what they're doing. Um, however, they're not blindly loyal. So that's kind of why they ask those why questions, because if they're committed, they're willing to put in the extra hours and do what they need to do to really become invested in your organization, but they're also not afraid to go elsewhere and find that um, other places too. Um, so next we have um, judge them by results and not FaceTime. So this kind of relates back to the need for a work-life balance. Um, general. Uh, Sorry, millennials enjoy flexible schedules. Um, we, you know, we watched our parents work themselves into the ground, and then the 2008 recession came, and maybe our parents were laid off, so we had to watch them pivot. And we've kind of grown up knowing that if I am attuned to, um, you know, really investing myself and in showing my assets to a company, then they'll hang on to me. Um, so they're driven by results and not just clocking in nine to five every day. And we just really want to make most of our time. Um, so this translates, as we've talked about before, the technology piece of it. Um, we're very technologically savvy. We're always trying to find new ways, quicker ways, faster ways to save time um, because it's just so interwoven into our lives. We've grown up with internet, cell phones, all of that. If there's a faster way to do it, we're going to do that. Um, so next we have respond quickly, um, which has to do with instant gratification. So this one made me laugh a little bit because I feel like millennials get the bad rap for we need our trophy. Everyone deserves a trophy. Everyone needs to approval. But this actually really relates to um, our sense of wanting to be motivated and that we are willing to dedicate ourselves. We want to know that at the end of the day, what we're doing every day is core to who we are, um, which, you know, also just goes back to, um, just giving opportunities for them to give back um, and just responding to that feedback and um, giving people an opportunity to have the tools to succeed. Um, so feeding in to the next one, to give opportunities to give back. Um, millennials are very attuned to what's going on in the world, what your company is doing to give back to things that are going on. Um, so paying attention to social responsibility initiatives, um, DE&I efforts, environmental impact, um, volunteering, things like that, um, millennials are really paying attention to. And along with that, we're also in the generation where we may be starting families. Um, we're statistically kind of pushing that age back a little bit, um, but this is kind of when that is starting. And we're starting families after having insane amounts of student loan debt. Um, so we have to have flexible options for us to really make the most of that. And we're also the most educated generation in the workplace. So, you know, we, when we're looking into childcare, we're not just looking for a daycare to plop the kids during the day. We're looking for something that's going to segue into their education. So we're looking for quality childcare, um, flexible, you know, work-life balance, and also just how our jobs are core to who we are as people. It's interesting, Rachel, you mentioned, um, the uh, you know sort of how millennials look at their career and I know um, in terms of asking why and so forth and, and you know some of the earlier generations didn't have you know I'm struck by how people now when they go to school and they start careers they're very focused on what they want to do what they don't want to do and um, you know many people that I know that are baby boomers you know th th there wasn't as much of an emphasis 
on what you're going to major on and that, you know, doing this many internships and that's that sort of linear path. And so a lot of us went into the workforce and let our careers evolve. We worked hard wherever we were needed in companies and was received satisfaction from having done that. So, it, you know, it is a very interesting uh, contrast and didn't ask as many why questions in part because of the deference to authority. And so when you, as you got more involved in why things were happening, it's sort of how you elevated in some ways. Wow. Uh, you had more perspective to participate in it. So that's very interesting. And to clarify the second to last bullet that, that, that Rachel appeared to take a little bit of umbrage with, um, you know, that instant gratification piece, uh, a, a, a significant character shaping event is the internet. Mm -hmm. The internet provides quick, instant answers and feedback. So to help you out a little bit, it's not that, you know, you need a trophy. It's you have the internet, you know, you, you no right. longer, we, we no longer have, you know, remember we had the bookshelves with all the encyclopedias. We don't have to have the encyclopedias. We technically don't have to go to the library all the time. You know, we have it all at our disposal, which is in a way, instant feedback, instant gratification, instant answers. I think too, um, with the, you know, in response to the technology piece, um, work was structured differently, even, you know, 25, 30 years ago. Since, since I was probably 25 years old, I always had an assistant. So I did not learn certain things. Like I still muddle through in Excel as you know, best I can and things, some things like that. Um, and so th that is just something that's just not, that is, is not quite as existent as it once was. And so people have from the start been participating in all aspects of their work. Whereas in the past, it was much more uh, segmented, I think. Mm -hmm. And the constant critique part, which is a part of the work, you know, can be sometimes interpreted as 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 negative. But but again, keep in mind some of the character shaping events. 9-11, you know, Oklahoma City bombing, Columbine, Clinton impeachment. These are things that shaped, you know, the need for one to question in some regards authority. And what do I really see? Many K-12 curricula, they, they're, they're taught from kindergarten up to question everything a little bit beyond the Socratic method, but to really take it apart, reason with it, put it back together, critique everything. And so some of these, you know, we, we know, assuming people are being respectful, it is again, a characteristic of the generation. And lastly, we see uh, th this last generation here that we're currently dealing with that's, again, depending upon which skill you use, they're currently somewhere between the age of seven and uh, maybe 23, you know, they, 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 they would love for the work to be connected to something bigger and that to be to communicated regularly, even if that's things like community service. Um, as Rachel said it before, based on the, her generation that, you know, we want to see our future here. We want to see, you know, or have a vision of what we might be. We see in the Department of Recruiting that a, a number of people want to go to the, to the, the, the president and CEO position very, very fast, you know, but, you know, they have to be able to see career progression or it can be discouraging uh, at times, providing again, learning opportunities so that they can connect to something bigger and see themselves as a part of something bigger. Thinking again about the internet, thinking about texting, thinking about, you know, FaceTime, instant, you know, communication. This generation is used to grew up on instant feedback, you know, things being in the cloud. So by the time they get home, the teachers already responded. You know, we don't have to print and our printer ran out of ink, go to the store, get some more, peel a little size of the paper off with the little holes in it. No, no, everything is right there. And so the expectation that they have inherently sometimes is my feedback and communication is right there. And of course, being flexible, allowing for greater independence, creating community, going back to the first bullet, looking to be a part of something is, is very, very valuable. Some from other generations may call this a little bit of an oxymoron because it may seem like, well, we're more connected virtually, but yet distant personally. And so th there can be some discussion around that. Uh, but in this generation, connectivity is any form of connection, whether virtual and or physical. And of course, valuing financial incentives, 
you know, I said before that some value time over money. That's not to lessen the importance of money, but 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 this generation, you know, does value you money also. So we'll we'll pause there, Tiffany. If there are any questions in the chat that we did not see, we'll do our best to address them now. Great, thank you all so so much. Um, and there were a few questions um, in the chat and the Q and A. And just a reminder for anybody who does have any additional questions, feel free to drop them in the Q and A, and we'll do our best to address them. And um, also, any strategies that people yeah. have that have worked in terms of bridging, yeah. that, that would be, I think, really helpful too. Absolutely, absolutely. These are, this list is not exhaustive. Again, we. We have a much larger training. This is just a dipstick, but please share some strategies that have worked for you also. Great. So in the meantime, going into questions, uh, one of the questions we got was, can you ask the panelists to comment on the impact of economic downturns have had in the various generations? Mm. Uh, so, um, I mean, I think security in the workplace you know, uh, certainly traditionalists had insecurity in terms of income and um, depression and rebuilding and so forth. And so a sense of security and maybe maybe um, a lack of confidence with the security, whereas later generations that saw their parents succeed and, and, and felt more hopeful, you know, may have felt more autonomous in terms of what they asked for, how they behave in the workplace. Those are my initial thoughts. So, so it's a great question. So you're making me dig in my, 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 my mental notes. So traditionalists, when we talk of economics, associated with that was the Great Depression. You know, so, so the idea of something like that happening and us, that generation, having to pick themselves up and fight and work back. That's an idea of where some of that work ethic could have come from. Next. Um, we, ha we have baby boomers. There wasn't necessarily a, a economic piece that, that we see there happening. Uh, that was more of a time of war that does impact economics. So we had in that range, the Cold War, the Korean War, we had Vietnam, you know, so, so think you know, that impacts the economy, shaping it, you know, and some might argue helping or hurting it. When we look at Generation X, yeah, we had the oil embargo in terms of something that could have hit the economy in some way. But in that generation, that was the worst recession uh, in the job market since the Great Depression. So again, thinking about the, the generation of not really trusting in some regards of authority, but yet comfortable with authority, you know, seeing all these things impacts, again, the, the fact that, listen, we had another depression. I'm going to work. But despite all the effort that this preceding generation put in, I'm still in a similar situation in this Great Depression. So I'm going to work, but I'm going to realize that I could lose it all. So I'm going to spend more time with my family. You know, so these are some character shaping events for for the ec economic side of things. As you, I have know. a very like tactical example, which is just for millennials. Okay. Millennials is interesting because that's a booming economy and job market you know, within their time frame, And as you know, some of the economists on the line know that some are expecting another crash, you know, in the years to come based on the things that are happening currently. Um, and then, you know, that will obviously be something that shapes our kids that are younger now. So think if you ever had a conversation with someone about paying off your mortgage, what that could be based on different generations. Um, there are people who, who know with the mortgage rates the way they are, does it make sense to pay off your mortgage or invest that in the um, stock market now given the returns and so forth. So people who are more, who have been through financial downturns might just want the security, they don't care if it makes financial sense. And people who are more optimistic or who have benefited from a, a healthier um, investment climate and so forth, realize that sensibly perhaps you could, it makes more sense to do something else. So, you know, it drives all sorts of decisions about how you choose to enact different things in, in your life, your work life, in your personal life. 
Great, thank you all. Uh, next question, um, this is in reference to the chart that was in the presentation um, about the different generations in the workforce. Um, it seems like baby boomers and Gen Y are outnumbering Gen X in the workforce. Does this mean Gen X has a higher likelihood to retire than baby boomers? Rachel, do you wanna take that one? Well, I'm wondering if it has anything to also just do with the fact that it was a, a baby boom versus the the next generation. I mean, I'm not, I don't know the statistics on that exactly, but um, yeah, I mean, if, if baby boomers were the next generation after the Great Depression, then there might be that drive to continue working longer than Gen X. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah that, that, that's real. And, and that's a great point. The, the, the statistics say typically that baby boomers, there was a baby had birthed every uh, 17 minutes for 20 years. So every yeah. 17 minutes for 20 years. And as Rachel alluded to, you know, the, the, the X millennial, and I'm assuming Z will, uh, are pushing some of their family choices to later in life. Right. You know, and so there's some data out now saying, well, you know what, there's, there may be discrimination based on ageism. And that may be true, absolutely. But then we also have to look at the fact that the market for those at a certain age is smaller that are looking for employment. And then the converse of that is, you know, there used to be a time where, uh, you know, you could work in a factory, um, retire, get a good pension, buy a nice house and live happily ever after. We know those times are gone. And so it requires people to stay in the workforce longer. I, I saw that there was something in the in the chat about how the, this relates to DE and I to some extent. And I mean, I think a lot of the same principles that we talk about when we talk about other forms of diversity apply here in terms of learning what you can, learning about the history um, of the generations as you learn about different cultures and sort of what, what motivates, drives, or impacts them. And also having uncomfortable conversations, um, you know, talking about some of these things. Um, uh, I, there was, um, just had an example that left me, um, but, um, oh, I know what it was. So um, a lot of times we're in meetings where, um, so I mentioned we have a, you know, a large IT staff and they all, they all do gaming and uh, like talk about things. I just like, I don't even know what they're saying. And, um, you know, to think about, oh, there might be other people in the room. How do we make this accessible? Likewise, I could be talking about something that I, you know, other people have an experience. So to, to be much, to be aware of how, how to include to include people and to be inclusive. And um, so I think a lot of the same themes, the goal being to, that, to um, benefit from the diversity of your staff, however, in whatever form it comes, age, ethnicity, gender, et cetera, and, and to have proactive strategies to, to do that um, so that people do feel included and valued and, Jaquel and I were joking uh, when we have, sometimes when we have an icebreaker uh, or some, I think on maybe on our profiles, it asks like, what do you do in your spare time? And um, I told him, I'm never not going to say what I do anymore because I feel like it makes me look like I'm trying to fit in with younger people when in fact, I'm really not. So I always say I like live music and I like going to breweries because they have large music, but I don't want to look like I'm trying to I'm like trying too hard, even though that's the truth. So like thinking about those things and being more your authentic self, like, why should I care? So just thinking about those sorts of things. So authenticity, uncomfortable conversations. Um, I put something up today uh, at InSource on, a, on a, one of our channels that I never would at actually like three years ago had would have talked to my coworkers about, particularly those that, are probably millennials, which is that I'm going to an event and I need to bring a joke. So I posted it out to the whole company. I would never have done that uh, without these kind of mediums. But I, I, I was like, kind of, I'm kind of looking forward to see how that plays out. But you know, just trying to step out of your comfort zone, do other things, think about your the people that you're working with.
Great, thank you all for that. Um, next question um, is, have you observed that generational attributes are different for people who are immigrants or first generation offspring of immigrants? I don't think I could hazard a guess there, but I, 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 I'm not an expert in that. Um, I have to believe that those things absolutely play a role in, in how people fit in, you know, personal, even though these generational attributes are good kind of guideposts, certainly personal style, personal experience, absolutely overlay the tendencies of a generation, particularly if they didn't go through those historical events in the same way that, are, that other people have. I would, I would agree. Great, thank you for that. Um, next question I have here is, um, do you think the advances in medical technology and education also have big impacts on the generational differences? My, my humble opinion, again, I'm not an expert, in my humble opinion, when we look historically, I, I think it impacts because it helps. I think every, you know, every generation brings something to the table for the betterment of our world. And when you, when you think about the fact, let's take the civil rights movement where Dr. King was young. He was, you know, 20s, early 30s, but he had men, Ralph Abernathy, he had Gandhi, he had people that were much older than him that invested in him, you know, and he wouldn't be where he was at that particular time without other generations. Then he had Jesse Jackson, who was at North Carolina a and you know, with other people that were younger than him to carry it forward. So I think we do ourselves a terrible disservice when we continue to, to, to segregate and categorize as opposed to coming together. So the answer is it, it doesn't create a divide if we use it the correct way. It can add different layers to reach different people, which again, we say, how does this connect to diversity? Because it's clear, the more differences that one may have or be a part of a project, the more perspectives one brings, which increases the likelihood of the product being better. So, the, if, you know, without, I know we said don't use this word, but I'm gonna use it now just for the, to prove a point. The old need the young and the young need the old. I would also say that the education piece of that, especially in the younger generations, with so many more people having formalized education, it makes the job search that much more competitive. You're constantly looking for ways to stand out because when you graduate, you are one of millions of people to also graduate, which is different from previous generations. So, um, you know, higher education is just, it's a positive thing that it's so much more common. It just also then, you know, um, it impacts the, the person's needs in a workplace and what they're really looking for at the end of the day. Right, thank you all for that. Um, next question I have here is, how are employers' policies over the decades affect generational differences? I mean, I think that, um, you know, when we work with clients, if you think of the days when you used to have, for example, organizational charts, right? Hierarchies of certain types and all of the different phases, flat organization, um, you know, it's all the different versions of organizational structures. Well, now lots of, lots of us don't really operate with a, four, we, we may have um, the fluid structures depending on what's going on. Um, and it's, it's, it's sort of interesting. Um, but so if you're used to those sorts of formal structures, we're often asked uh, at clients and, and internally, like, what is the organizational structure? Can we see the chart? And, um, it's interesting because for example, I'll speak for InSource, we don't necessarily publish an organizational chart. We have certain roles and so forth. Um, and part of that is because it is fluid. So I have been at InSource for 19 years, or maybe it's 20. And my job has changed many, many times. And I've been in different boxes, depending on what we need. And, and, um, and we like that flexibility. And we're optimistic that it will work. Whereas, again, people who, there, there are other generations that like things to be structured and to know what the expectations are. And um, to see the job description, like, I don't, so 
I think um, that is, is a big difference and can influence it. In terms of policies, you know, there's more of a shift now. I think I've seen the biggest shift in, for example, personnel policies over the last couple of years. There, were, there was very little change in the last 20 years. You know, there were very standard policies. They were written in a very standard way. There's a lot more attention paid now to language to um, the directiveness, the authoritarian, you know, tendencies of those kind of policies, um, uh, how flexibly they're written to give employers uh, more uh, uh, discretion in decision making. To be, to you know, right now we're doing a lot of equity lens on on employee handbooks to be sure people feel included, and um, and that the benefits that companies offer address the concerns of multi-generations. Yeah, I, I would agree in specific policies that, that we see and have seen, um, maybe we can say improving uh, maternity and paternity policies, um, policy around mental health and support for that. I saw our state at DEI, DEI uh, benefits, you know, 401k is very important, more important to those closer to retirement than others, you know, then, you know, um, time off, is more important to those starting in the workforce than others. So those are some policies that depending upon the dominant generation in your organization, you may you may look for, you know, to, to, to help you by catering those policies um, to, to that generation. Awesome. Thank you all so much. I know we're at the top of the hour now. So thank you to the audience as well for all your questions. Um, Salaha, Rachel, and DePaul, thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us this morning. And just a reminder for everybody, this recording will be sent to you all later today, along with the presentation slides. Um, and we also want to thank all of our diversity, equity, and inclusion sponsors of this series. And thank you all so much for joining us this morning. Take care. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure.